Okay, welcome to another Wednesday Team Prosperity meeting. This is a weekly meeting where we get into direct concept strategies and education that can help you grow your business, whether you're looking to build a book of business, like a practice, or whether you're looking to build an agency or multiple agencies. These are some things that can help you uh, through that path. So right now we are getting towards the end of August, which means that some schools have already started. Some people are getting back from either the physical part of the vacation mode or the mental part. So as we go forward, we're trying to capitalize on this next period of time leading up into Thanksgiving because it's a very productive time of the year for a lot of businesses and industries, including ours. All right, we, last week we talked about you know, it's time to get real. And really, what does that mean? Well, once you have your business goals and you've determined what you can achieve in any given time frame, it's important to also consider what it's going to take to get you there. And are you willing to do what's required and necessary to reach that desired endpoint? That's for yourself. That's for your clients. That's for your partners. Um, you know, we always talk about three points. Where are you now? Where do you want to go? Um, and then how are you going to get there? So same thing, it's just over and over and over again with discovery periods of you know, internal self-inventory or external with dealing with partners and clients. And this week, we're gonna be talking about not customer support, not being customer focused, not being customer driven, but being customer obsessed. Why that's important, what that means to your business and why it's going to develop a culture um, that is something that you're gonna be proud to be part of. One of the things that we have to take into consideration when being customer assessed is we have to understand and believe the American dream is still alive and well. It's a more you know, jaded path in terms of getting to an end desired endpoint based on a lot of the things that we encounter that our clients are encountering day to day. But what we can do is we can build you know, linear equations to get there in shorter paths. So first thing you have to understand is what you're doing is meaningful. It's going to make an impact in some small way. And as your organization gets bigger, your impact gets bigger. You also have to understand that you are leading the way. in a lot of those parts of the industry, what we're doing, what we're bringing to the marketplace, how we're using technology, education, tax law changes, all of these things, we're leading the way. So you're going to have to find your best approach. And really what that means is your language, you know, your personas that you're going after, where do you operate and what marketplaces, what social media platforms. But in doing that, your best approach is going to be to lead with customer obsession. Once you do that, once you make the customer, the client, the focal point of your business, things start to fall into place. Why is that important? Because like we opened today, you know, whether you're building a book of business, you know, practice on your own, whether you're building a branch office, virtual sales teams across the nation, um, this is going to have an impact, a very positive impact on and a very positive ripple effect on your ability to do any of those things. So it's an important piece of your business model. And once you make it the focal piece of your business model, like we just said, things start to fall into place and then you start attracting the right types of people in terms of the clients or the partners that you wanna help, that you can help, and you're dedicated to help. You know, the end point that we're getting to, we're taking this maze and we're getting people to the point that we can map out, like we talked about, more linear equations to get to a desired end outcome rather than just drifting. So being obsessed with helping them get to that desired income um, will help your business. It's going to, like I just said, attract the right types of clients, the right types of partners, um, and then that helps you start to work smart instead of working hard. So now you're not just bringing in massive amounts of people, throwing them against the wall to see if this person is a client, if this person is a partner. You're bringing in the right people, and you're spending time with them to help discover where they're trying to get to, how they're going to get there, you know, what they're willing to do to get there, and how you play a part to help them get there. All right, guys, let's get into it. So reasons why obsessive people are more likely to be successful. So some of the things that obsession will help with is obsession gives you courage. Something interesting happens when you're obsessed. You ditch that cowardly lion act and you become courageous. When you're obsessed, you have the courage to get started. You have the courage to pick yourself up after falling down, failing, 
And then you have the guts to stare fear directly in the face. When you're obsessed about stuff, the little excuses, you know, they don't even come into play. So that's one of the ways that can help you. Uh, number two, obsession makes you a master of time and scheduling. You know, I'm personally getting more and more obsessed with my daily schedule. As a successful business owner, you have to be, without keeping a close watch, completing daily priorities and achieving goals is unlikely to happen. You have to have targets, you have to have objectives, you have to have, to have intention, and you have to have time management. Most importantly, it ensures that you're going to spend your time on productive activities. If there's no purpose behind a meeting, why give it space on your calendar? Also, if there's a chunk of downtime where you don't have direct stuff to be doing, it's a great time to block out some times for things like reading, exercising, stuff that you know that you need to get done along with your business activity. Uh, number three, obsession encourages thought and innovation. When you're obsessed, you're hungry, and that hunger is 24-7. It's the only thing on your mind. Think about like a drug addict. They get up. They basically have nothing to start the day. They find a way to get their drug. You're obsessed with that. You need to be obsessed about something positive, which is helping people. You know, that may turn some people off, but not successful people. Because of their obsession, they're constantly thinking about new opportunities, innovative ways to enhance the product, service, the client experience whatever that might be. In fact, there's, you know, that's why successful people are known for allotting time for reflection. You know, people like Elon Musk have said that feedback loops empower them to constantly remain aware of what they could do better and question their ways of thinking. All right, obsession harnesses your focus and energy. Let's say you wake up on any given weekend, let's say a Saturday morning, and you're craving like a donut and a coffee. It's the only thing you're currently concerned about. As a result, you almost subconsciously grab your keys, grab your wallet, head down to the local donut store for, you know, the cup of coffee, you know, the donut, whatever is going to satisfy your craving. Successful people have this feeling on a daily basis. When they want something, they devote their entire focus and their entire energy to making it a reality. Until they achieve their goal, they're not really focused on anything else. And then number five, obsessive people love to say no. I know this might sound weird, but it's something that you need to understand. You know, as a parent, you know, we have a child that's nonverbal with autism, but he can still get out the word no. So as a parent, you know, you can guys can vouch for the fact that most kids' favorite word, especially when they're learning to speak, is no. It turns out it's also successful. Um, it's also um, a favorite among the successful people. You know, when successful people are honed into one thing and they say no to other outside opportunities, ventures, whatever it might be, it allows them uh, to be concentrated. It also prevents them from, you know, getting off track, drifting, et cetera. So it's very, very important. And then obsessive people make conscious decisions. Instead of pointing fingers, successful people take personal responsibility. Guys, that's a must in your business. For example, if the business fails, they don't blame the, uh, the government. They don't blame their customers. It was ultimately their choice to start the business. And if they didn't adapt to the changing marketplace, they have to accept responsibility for that. Uh, once, also, you know, people look at failure um, as a learning experience. And that's really, really important because everything's not going to work out for you. Don't take fear as a negative outcome. Just take it as a learning experience. And then number seven, obsessive people, they seek mentors. You know, burying your nose into a book is only going to take you so far. Entrepreneurs need mentors that can help them learn the knowledge and the skills that they need to put to work to build a successful business. You know, Malcolm Gladwell, you know, popularized the idea that 10,000 hours to master a skill. So why not take advantage of other people who've already been down that path and mastered the skill? It's important to seek out mentors that can help you. And then obsession beats talent. This is a very, very, very important um, aspect of obsession because, you know, Tom Brady, you know, if you've looked at his pictures from the, uh, from the workouts in the NFL camps, you know, he was basically rated as an average quarterback, but he'll go down as one of the best quarterbacks of all time. He was talented enough to play the position and make the league. 
but he works his tail off in order to become the best. Obsession may seem like a sinister kind of idea in Hollywood movies, but it's entrepreneurial fuel. And when it's directed towards the right things, it can have amazing results. Those who obsess over their business are likely to stick with their ventures well beyond the time that the non-obsessed have already given up. So obsession beats talent, you know, uh, hard work beats talent, all of these things. You guys understand if you're bringing people in, understand that, you know, we do look for certain skill sets, but we also look for certain motivating factors and certain mission points. Are they buying in to what we're trying to do for the client? Ways to make your business customer obsessed. So once we understand, you know, what is being customer obsessed, how do we, you know, kind of orchestrate or how do we build the business around being customer obsessed? Well, first you have to actually commit to being customer first. Seems obvious, but it all starts with a real commitment to being a customer first business, implementing a customer first marketing strategy. You need to update the models, the business objectives to put your customers at the focal point and the core of that model. One way to do this, rather than focusing solely on your product, what it does, how great it is, all the benefits, you know, you got to focus on how it solves the problem of your customer. And this is one thing that I think we fall into the trap of. Once we start to learn more about our products and our services, we want to tell people more about it. That's a mistake. You want to stay on the solution, stay on the problem that we're solving for that particular client. Recap commitments at the end of an interaction. The last thing that happens in an interaction, it has a disproportionate influence on people's overall impression of the memory of the experience. It's called you know, recency bias. So whatever happens last in the interaction is going to be remembered the most. So to help end on a high note, you want to conclude your calls, your meetings, your emails, any other type of interaction with a recap of specifically what you're committing to do to help the person that you're serving. This is important, guys. This will instill confidence in your clients, and your customers, showing them that you have everything under control and you're the right person to be speaking to. You got to set clear time-based expectations. We talked about being obsessed with the next action step. This is kind of going on the back of that. When making commitments, you know, whether you're going to call somebody, deliver a proposal, provide requested information, whatever it might be, don't promise to get back to people soon or shortly. Those are relative terms. And they can mean different things to different people. In most business contexts, ambiguity is absolutely the enemy, guys. Uncertainty deprives people of what's known as perceived control. And as a result, it makes the experience far less pleasant. That's why waiting in line for a known length of time, it feels shorter and less annoying than an unknown wait time. And then also take ownership with six simple words. I can help you with that. It's one of the most powerful, uh, one of the most powerful and impactful statements that you can make to a prospect or a proposed client. If you confidently utter those words to a customer or a partner who comes to you for assistance, it immediately changes the tenure of the interaction. To the person on the receiving end, it's a signal of ownership and advocacy. It's an indication that someone is taking personal accountability for addressing their needs. That's important. That's being customer obsessed. That makes the customers feel heard, understood, and cared for. And when you do that, people start opening up. People feel more um, invited to start talking about what they're trying to accomplish. You know, take ownership with these six words. And then also, you need to surprise people with your responsiveness. And there's a misconception in the marketplace that you need to appear real, real busy. You know, you don't have to do that. I think that's a false sense of um, confidence on the other side. What people are looking for is help with their problems. They're looking for solutions to their problems. So imagine submitting like some type of an inquiry through a website and then hearing back from a company rep, a real rep in a matter of minutes. Exceptional responsiveness is a rarity in today's world and when we encounter something novel and unexpected, our brain is biochemically primed to forge long-term memories about that experience. People often like to create the illusion that they're busier, like we were talking about, than they really are. So they just sit on the email, the text, or voicemail for a while, making their customers or their prospects or their colleagues wait. Don't fall into that trap. Rapid response alone, even if it's just acknowledging receipt of the inquiry, can make a striking impression 
on the other side. Now that you want to proactively engage. It's not enough to just listen, guys. You need to act. Engage with your customers regularly via social media, chat, direct message, email, whatever it might be. Ask questions, see how they're doing. Don't just make it a habit of responding to issues. Be a company and be a person and be an organization that values the opinions of your customers all, your, all the time. Celebrate your customers. One way to be customer obsessed is to celebrate your customers. Customer obsessed companies don't just have people that buy their products. They have enthusiastic, dedicated fans. These fans don't appear overnight. They're the result of a business that continuously celebrates them, appreciates them, and actually listens to them. Empower your customers to participate in things like you know, research and development, questions, surveys, polls, whatever it might be. Your customers are media. And that's an important concept to understand. So by giving them access uh, to you and making them focus, you know, the focal point of your business objectives, they're more likely to advocate, you know, and be the advocates of your business, you know, the user generated content, the referrals, and you'll get a far greater return on your marketing investment when you understand that your existing client base and your customers is an extreme asset and a media point. Prioritize existing customers. This goes on the back of what we just talked about. Businesses can sometimes focus so much on acquiring new clients, they neglect their existing ones. A customer-obsessed organization prioritizes the need of its current, current base. Uh, first and foremost, we continue to work with our clients hands-on for long periods of time. Their happiness and their repeat, you know, coming back to us for different types of products and services should be at the top of your mind. That doesn't mean that you should stop reaching out to new audiences altogether. It just means that new customer acquisition should be a secondary goal. Remember, if you have retention and loyalty and that becomes a priority, you're going to get referrals. You're going to get new business from that alone. So how do we increase client acquisition and retention in our current business by being customer obsessed? Well, first of all, you have to ask your customers for feedback, continually get their opinions, a customer-obsessed culture deeply understands the lifestyle, the motivation, and the interest of its buyers. People buy products and services to solve a problem. So intimately understanding your customer's needs is the first step in being customer-obsessed. You know, that discovery, it's all about the client. Then show, don't tell. You know, shoppers these days, they're not fooled by empty promises. They can see right through that. Uh, they want to see a company that makes good on its commitment. So respond to questions and concerns promptly. Use chat, help desk, dedicated email accounts, but don't make your customers wait for a response like we were talking about earlier. Pay attention to the little things. This is important overall in your business, but when you're building a customer obsessed business, getting like an order or getting an illustration right simply isn't enough to be considered customer obsessed. Uh, paying attention to the little things like team members' accomplishments on the inside can also be important. And then on the outside, the workplace is key for employee satisfaction, and that translates into customer satisfaction. Remember, if you've got partners who are buying into the mission, and they're going out there every day being customer obsessed, well, that internal mission point has a huge positive ripple effect. So with that being said, you know, celebrating and you know, one of your partner's exemplary customer service, you know, uh, stories or, or feedback is another way to highlight the tiny details that add up to make, you know, a big impact. Recognize people who are going above and beyond and make that known in the organization and make that something that is celebrated. The right people, the right place at the right time. This is the importance of getting the right people in the right vehicle, in the right seats, and the wrong people off the vehicle. That helps ensure a uh, business to achieve greatness. Not every person is cut out to be your client. Not every person is cut out to be your partner. And not every partner is cut out for customer interactions. Those individuals may have valuable skills in other areas of the business, or they just might not be a fit at all. Don't bring people in just to have a number on the board. Hiring people who are customer focused is the essential first step in this whole process. The second is ensuring the leadership team recognizes the impact that these workers and partners have on this overall client experience and how we're trying to build it better. 
And then finally, guys, we're going to talk about today the steps to building a customer obsessed culture in your sales organization. Remember, if you build it internally, externally, it'll take care of everything that you're trying to accomplish. So number one is research. Customer obsession starts with understanding your customer's goals and how your offerings, your products, your services, education, whatever it is that you're offering can help them. We should think of ourselves as problem solvers, helping to make our customers' outcomes more attainable and more real. And that means sometimes that we have to go outside the box. Our offerings may not always <clears throat> be what our customers need. And that's why we approach the research phase. In the beginning, guys, you have to have a discovery with that prospect so that we can decide if we're the right people to help them. Because if not, we're wasting each other's time. Even if we can't directly help them, we should always look for an opportunity to help our customers help themselves, demonstrate they were committed to their success and helping them and not just selling products and services. Step two is the insight. None of us just work for the sake of working. Customers are individuals with their own interests and their own drives, motivating factors that we talked about before. The more we understand what's motivating our customers at a personal level, the better we'll be able to partner up with them and connect our products and services to their desired outcomes. This insight should inform you know, our behavior, our communication style as well. We should consider what we help each customer with and how that customer needs to feel important and comfortable. It's our responsibility to adapt our style, our communication, our language, whatever it is, to effectively meet the needs of our customers, especially if those styles are very different. And that goes back to what we talked about several weeks ago, which is honing in on certain personas that you can work with, that you want to work with, um, that you best work with, that you speak their language, et cetera. Uh, step three is commitment. Commitment to customer obsession is an organizational drive to discover customer needs and then respond immediately. What do our clients need? And then get back to them with those solutions. Many, you know, organization, enterprises, businesses, they already focus on meeting customer needs, but they make the critical mistake of not doing it in real time. So understand what's going on with the economy, you know, understand what's going on with your clients and your prospects, and then get in front of them with a commitment to help. Number four, rewards. Developing consistent customer obsession takes reinforcement, right? So as humans, we're apt to keep doing something if we've been rewarded for doing it. And the more we do something, the more habitual it becomes and then just becomes routine, you know, subconsciously, not even really thinking about it. To reinforce customer obsession from the top to the bottom of our organization, you know, we want to make sure that we establish you know, times, whether that be weekly, quarterly meetings, whatever it might be, and we can you know, call out and name those people who've been doing a really, really good job internally on building or helping us build a customer-obsessed you know, sales organization. And then step number five is leadership. Business leaders in the prime position to drive customer obsession from the top down. Customer obsession principles need to become part of our conversation internally, externally, needs to become part of our business planning, you know, it needs to become part of our pipeline reviews, everything that our business does from A to Z to create a customer obsessed culture, it must be modeled at the highest levels. So what we're asking everybody to do is carry out a customer focused strategy, you know, making sure that your needs, yes, you have goals, you have motivating factors, you have vision, and that's very important. But when we're out there, we need to make sure that we put our customers first. And then step six is education. Customer obsession also requires empowerment all the way through the organization. That's why we're constantly trying to help, you know, both our existing partner base and our new partner base understand what we're trying to do, what we're trying to accomplish, and how we help. So when you look at reward mechanisms, they can play a huge role in the process. You know, training, refreshers, e-learning resources, whatever it might be, the more that we can empower our partners, you know, as they come on board and as they remain with us, to engage with a customer-obsessed mindset, the more ingrained it's going to become. And then once it's ingrained in our brain, it just you know, becomes part of our day-to-day -day behaviors. 
So we wanted to talk about customer obsession today, why that's important no matter what you're doing in terms of your goals, book of business, agencies, and no matter what roles you have right now within our organization, marketers, managers, educators, educators, salespeople, whatever it might be, putting your clients first, putting your customers first, and really honing in and concentrating on how you can help them get to a desired endpoint is how you're going to create not only a nice client base and how you're going to create a nice internal organization full of people who think just like you, but you're going to go out there and you're going to meet all and probably smash all the goals that you have for this business. So that's all we have for this week, guys. We'll continue to dive in more and more each week on things that can help you with your business.